first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't really get what I what you expected from me. Yeah. So I thought about a few slides on um, what we actually do. Exactly. Uh, we cannot be exactly, exactly in the treatment room because uh, in the um, treatment planning room because it's full of people on Wednesday. So they are actually working there. Mm -hmm. I can I can't really see myself on my laptop, but I can try to share my screen. Maybe. Hello, come here. Oh, I know, I knew, but I couldn't um, reactivate the, um, that's why I was okay. um, waiting. Okay, everything is but fine. I knew I was muted, but uh, I couldn't <laughs> find a way to unmute myself. Everything is fine now, please go okay. ahead. Okay, so um, I'm a medical physicist and I'm working at um, CNAO in Italy since many years. Uh, I didn't follow the um, your workshop since the beginning, so uh, I'm sure many things I'm gonna say, uh, you already saw them, but maybe it's, um, it's a good resume. I try to be fast. I don't know exactly what should happen in this hour that we have. Uh, I don't really wanna take time from other people. So uh, just stop me if you just wanna ask questions or uh, um, if I'm taking too much time. Anyhow, what we do now uh, is um, we acquire, um, for treatment planning, what you have to do is you have to have a um, patient model and we take it with the CT scan, of course. And for all patients, we do um, 3D um, MRI scan for contouring of um, organs at risk and for the target volume. Of course, you can register the two imaging and you can uh, contour your um, patient model. For patients who cannot do uh, an MRI scan in the same position um, in which the city, the planning city has been acquired, so with the same uh, immobilization systems, we do um, contrast enhanced uh, CT scan. And for example, for uh, patients who undergo a 4D CT scan, we also do a um, 4D CT scan with uh, um, contrast. Then you need to have um, a beam model. So this is what we are using now. We are using RayStation uh, version 8B and we are moving towards uh, 10B. So in your treatment planning system, you're going to have uh, the measurement and the um, model computation of all your um, bread peaks for all your energies. We have carbons and, um, and protons. And then the um, absolute dose measurements in reference condition and the uh, beam lateral profile, so the lateral scattering profile. So th this part is actually very, very important because uh, we saw that it can really affect uh, those calculation. When we, at the beginning, we were using Singo, uh, which is a um, treatment planning system from, um, from Siemens. Then when we moved to RayStation, um, we did many recalculation of our patient just to see if the dose was going to change. And we saw that particularly for protons, moving from the uh, pension beam model that was used with Singo to the Monte Carlo model that is used in, um, in RayStation um, for the simulation of the lateral scattering of the proton, the dose was changing a lot. And this is, uh, for example, a DVH for um, a target volume in the head and neck. And you see that you can have really uh, strong differences in all the uh, dose distribution. Then you can, once you have your um, patient model and once you have your beam model, you can optimize your plan. It can actually get very complex. So, um, uh, for plan optimization, what the system does is called the inverse planning. I'm not sure everybody knows about this, but basically is a translation of your clinical goals. So your uh, goals in uh, target coverage and organ organ risk constraints, it's, they are translated into mathematical terms in um, what is called an objective function. And you can weight every constraint uh, according to your uh, priorities, to the clinical priorities. And then the, the cost function of the treatment is minimized. So it can really be, uh, be a bit complicated to evaluate a plan. You usually use the DVH and the um, isodose distributions. We have um, pencil beam scanning here, uh, both for protons and, uh, and carbon ions. So um, there are advantages and disadvantages actually, but from the treatment planning point of view, 
with passive means scanning, you can basically do um, follow two ways of, uh, of planning. You can do what is called single field uniform dose optimization. So for each beam, you optimize um, a uniform dose to your target volume. Or you can do what is called intensity moderated particle therapy, which is the particle version of um, IMRT. So with IMPT, uh, with carbon ions, we always do IMPT. Sometimes we do single field uniform dose with for very simple uh, proton plants. But with IMPT, of course, you have a higher flexibility because you can basically use all the degrees of freedom uh, that this technique um, provides because you can basically optimize a different number of particle, uh, different weight for each um, beam length of each pencil beam coming from each direction. But of course, you also uh, can obtain very strongly inhomogeneous dose distributions and inhomogeneous um, number of particles per, per spot. And this, of course, makes your plan much more sensitive to uh, whatever kind of uncertainty uh, you have. Uh, I listened uh, while I was working uh, in the afternoon this morning and in the afternoon to the to the presentation. It was really really interesting, and um, I know now you you have a lot of information about uncertainties. So with IMPT, you can really be uh, very sensitive to range setup and treatment delivery uncertainties. I will just show you some example. Um, I saw this slide this morning, so we don't really have to go through this again, but. Uh, just to um, remind you, it's uh, the problem with particles is that they stop, but you don't really know where they are going to stop. And if you change the um, uh, tissue densities for whatever reason along the beam path, wherever along the beam path, you can uh, change the position of the uh, of the break peak. So your dose will change, can change up to 100%. Uh, Either you, go, you give 100% less in the target volume or you give 100% more in the organ set risk. So this is an example of a um, not very robust plan. Uh, basically we define a plan that is robust when the uh, treatment goals are met despite uncertainties in patient and in the beam model. And the plan is acceptable over a certain range of uh, likely variations. So this was a not very robust plan, but it's, uh, it's like a, a worst case scenario because it's um, three uh, IMPT fields plan in the um, Sinonasa region, which is highly uh, inhomogeneous. But this is what happens if you have your plan and you introduce a two millimeter shift, and then you will have differences either in target coverage, but also in the organ set risk. And this, those deviations that you see here, they're not really predictable because they are not just uh, outside the target volume, but also inside. And this is due to the fact that every single field of this uh, three field plan is highly, the dose distribution of each single field, it's uh, um, highly homogeneous. So um, as you already discussed, can we really use a PTV? Well, um, yes, you can, but it doesn't really work because the problem is not only a dose shift uh, with particle therapy, but it's the fact that the dose is distorted. So it's not like with fo for photons, that the dose is not really uh, so much affected by um, changes in, um, in tissue densities along the beam path, but the, the dose is really uh, deformed. So um, you cannot really account it, um, account it for just adding margins uh, outside the PDB. You can do uh, simple things like, for example, use robust beam configuration, which means that you don't shoot against the uh, organ at risk. Um, this is a very old case. The tumor is this blue line. I'm not sure if you can see it. And this is the brainstem. So you, you could be tempted to use uh, a, a beam coming from here, just to use the um, distal follow up, not to, uh, to spare the, the brainstem. But then after one week, the, uh, there's no more tumor here. So, and you're shooting like 25 gray more to the, uh, to the brain stem. So that's not a good idea. This is an, another case uh, that we just treated actually. So it's a pancreas case. And um, we, for pancreas, we do a very um, uh, complex, um, how to say, uh, adaptive workflow. Because if you wanna use a lateral beam, coming from here, we don't have a gantry, so that's the main uh, issue at the moment. So if you wanna use maybe a lateral beam coming from here to spare a little bit the, the spinal cord, so not to use just a posterior beam, you need to take care 
of the fact that this part is gonna uh, change, the feeling of these abdominal uh, tracts is gonna uh, change completely. So the, the first one was the planning city, the second one was the evaluation city, uh, which we acquire in order to use it for robust plan optimization. So we actually optimize on both these two um, cities, trying to be more robust. And this is the city um, acquired just before uh, the treatment. So it was a um, different situation again. So this is something that it's really unpredictable. What you can do is uh, um, for sure robust evaluation. This is something that uh, it's now possible um, with the more, let's say, more recent treatment planning systems. And with robust evaluation, you actually introduce um, set up and, um, and range uncertainty uh, variation that it's um, consistent with the, um, how to say, uh, with, your, uh, with your patient verification protocol and with the uncertainties that you have in your, uh, in your daily routine, let's say. And you can recalculate your plan and see what will change according to all the scenarios that you have uh, considered. Of course, the larger is the um, DVH band, the, the less robust is your plan. And there are other kinds of uncertainties that you cannot really account before. So uh, what you have to do is definitely to follow your treatment and uh, um, introduce uh, some kind of adaptation in your treatment. So you, you need to have an adaptive protocol. If you cannot do it every day because you don't have a in-room CT or a fast calculation software that allows you to do the same calculation every day, you should at least um, set some periodic acquisition depending on uh, um, the treatment protocol. For example, for uh, these cases, we have we acquire um, re-evaluation CT not every week, but um, every eight fractions. And you see here, there was no tumor inside, while after one week, uh, there was more tumor inside. So the, the dose distribution was completely different. Here you have no, do, no more dose and hotspots inside the inside patient, inside the tumor. While in this other case, we had tumor shrinkage. So the patient after one week was, um, he could breathe very well. So we got a bit scared and uh, we acquired a new uh, CT scan and actually there was no more uh, tumor inside. So in, in this case, there's nothing to do. You need to replan the treatment. Um, for what concerns organ motion, uh, there are two things you, you should consider. The first one, of course, is what changes when you change the breathing phase. So the fact that your patient is actually breathing. So if you plan on a certain, um, on a certain condition, then this condition is going to change while the patient moves. And the second one, if you're doing um, pensive brain scanning, is the interplay effect. So the interference between the moving of the target and the moving of the beam. Yes. What we do yeah. is see uh, yes three, three minutes to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What we do okay. is we do a um, 4D CT scan, which anyway it's uh, um, just a shot at the um, at the moment. Sorry, it's just a shot of the um, a screenshot of the patient at the moment. So after after one week, also the uh, even if you acquire the same phase, it's gonna change. And uh, um, we do gating and rescanning for the treatment of these, uh, of these patients, trying to, let's say, um, minimize the uh, residual motion and the, the, those uncertainties during the treatment. We are now trying to use uh, biological figures of merits uh, to evaluate the plan. So we are doing a, which is something that um, started, everything started in the Netherlands when they started with protons. So we're trying to use NTCP models to um, evaluate the uh, treatment plans for, patient, for um, proton treatments to see if the patient it's, uh, um, uh, should receive a proton treatment instead of a photon treatment. And uh, what we have been studying a lot, this is also something that has been mentioned today, um, is the, uh, the effect of the uncertainties determined by the, the use of a different radiobiological model in the treatment plans with, uh, with carbon ions. So we, we evaluated at the beginning, we wanted to take uh, advantage from the experience from the Japanese, but in Europe, we are using the local effect model and they, they were using a um, semi-empirical model from Professor Kanai and now they're using the micro uh, kinetic dosimetric model. Anyhow, um, we saw that basically 
uh, if you use the same, um, if you deliver the same physical dose, uh, applying a different RB model, you will get completely different uh, RB weighted dose depending on the um, initial prescribed dose. So differences could go from 15% uh, up to 5% uh, in the um, commonly prescribed dose uh, per fraction in Japan. So we basically, we actually corrected our uh, prescription dose based on this. And uh, we also did um, retrospective analysis of uh, this approach where we realized that the uh, prescribed dose were uh, correct, but we were we had been too much conservative maybe on the constraints because we didn't correct for the biological model um, in the con in the organ secretion constraint used for planning. And this is something we have done now, actually, for uh, the optic pathways and the brainstem and rectum. And this was just a very fast overview because I didn't really know what you wanted to know. Yeah, this is perfect. Uh, so I it's think just it was very interesting to see after uh, some the, things we do in clinic now. Say. Yes, in <laughs> real life, uh, but, we yes. have seen uh, Matrad for uh, training and education, and now we see something that is uh, used in a hospital for treatment. Yeah. Thanks very much. That was uh, perfect, and I think. Um, if there are any questions, but let us uh, take uh, it to Niklas and uh, Hans Peter as they are uh, users of uh, treatment planning tool also if they want to have some exchange and some discussion with Sylvia. Yes, I just was uh, writing. Uh, thanks you very much um, um, for this uh, presentation. And I was just writing to Hans Peter because we did this practical call this afternoon and, and we always worry that when we show uh, the students these simple simulations that we can do with Madrid that they think nothing of this is real. No, and no, it's it everything was, real. Yeah, it's, it it's, really very, <laughs> it's very nice that, that um, you now basically showed all of this on, on the real patient cases and, and that it's really an issue in also in the treatment room and in, on the planning system that, that, that you have. Um, with the ray station that all of this translates directly into the clinical day-to-day -day, um, treatment planning. That's really nice. So uh, thanks yeah, yeah. a lot for, for showing this. Um, I think it's very nice for the participants to see. Yeah, while I was following you, uh, I was actually thinking that, yet, that yes, maybe the three slides I, I put together were right. <laughs> what you expected. <laughs> I, was, I, I think it was really good also with the, with the slides uh, from yesterday about optimization um, worked quite nicely and we also yeah, have, I have to I have to admit <laughs> that I didn't follow it yesterday. I'm sorry. Yes, no, but it, I think it was perfect. Uh, this okay. Way, so really nice. So there you come the questions. Uh, right. For you, uh, I think. Sylvia, there are some more questions for you. Uh, you can read them from the file. Yes. Is okay. multi-field, uh, single field always more robust than single uh, I'm not sure I can get the question. So uh, if you do single field, of course, it's single field uh, uh, uniform dose. Uh, if you do multi-field, then you can do it, uh, um, then you can deliver single field with several field versus single field. I suggest uh, that the participant that writes the question can unmute uh, and ask the question. Actually, basically, if you if you do, uh, are you asking one single field per day? Maybe. No, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm, very far away. Uh, right. So you. No, I lost you. Can you hear me now? Kind of. Hello. Yeah. Right. So you can optimize using SFUD instead of, uh, I mean, uh, SFO, sorry, instead of MFO. Yeah. Right. That's what I meant. Uh, so with SFO, you can have a plan with either one field or multiple fields. Mm -hmm. And is optimizing using multiple fields SFO always more robust than using a single field? Ah, okay. So um, let, let's say like this. So multiple field, single field uniform dose, it's usually more robust than IMPT. 
using one just one field uh, it's 99 percent of the time less robust than using multiple fields i cannot tell that it's 100 percent less robust than you sorry I, I don't remember if I, did, I said it correctly so multiple field is more robust than one single field but there are very few situations in which, for example, if you don't have a gantry, then you can use just maybe one field, because in that case, uh, choosing other two fields, they would be really, really, really not robust. So mm, I think we had very few situations in which we had to use one single field, but we did it. So it's, uh, I would say, yes, that uh, in, uh, Almost all situations, multiple fields is better, but uh, if you don't have a, a gantry, then sometimes you have to compromise. So it, it depends on uh, if all your fields, all the fields that you can choose are really robust. Okay, thank you. If we can uh, go briefly through- How can I simulate into play effect on race station? I don't know, actually. Pasa? No, sorry. Um, I don't know how you can simulate into play effect on race station. Mm, I'm pretty sure you can do it because you can do more or less whatever you want with race station if you're a very good um, Python uh, scripting um, creator, which I'm not. And uh, but I don't really know what you can do with race station is um, rescanning, use the rescanning. So what we do is uh, we use five rescanning for each field uh, and you can set that in uh, on race station i'm i'm pretty sure you can do a simulation of the interplay effect but uh, i cannot help you in this these results from pet sorry uh, i can't read the um okay uh do you use results from pet or only city are there special criteria which pet doesn't fulfill no, uh, the only criteria is that um, we don't really have a very good PET uh, at the moment and a PET scanner at the moment, but it's not only the PET scanner is that we, um, we don't have the license for uh, the radio tracer that uh, our medical doctors would like to use. So I think we are working on this now. And uh, for the moment, uh, the best option for us is to use um, MR scan. But for, um, I know that for some patients, we, we have um, PET scans uh, from, uh, from other centers. So usually it's very rare that only the CT scan is used for contouring. This is something that it's really not, not very common. Um, if we use a PET scan, it's coming from a different center because our PET scan is not very uh, useful. Um, most of the time it's an MR scan. And for 4D treatment, we are starting to acquire also for the MRI. And we are trying to study if we can use them to evaluate the residual breathing motion, uh, but it's ongoing. So for the moment, our, the, the field of view of our 4D MRI is still too, uh, too small to be used for um, contouring and, uh, and planning. Oh, okay, great. Uh, now let's uh, give a chance to the students to share their presentations and then you <laughs> experts, uh, you can uh, comment. Uh, Damir actually is uh, from University of Sarajevo and now he has an Erasmus uh, working in uh, DKFZ with our DKFZ colleagues. He started already like a month or so ago. So Damir, please share your slides and go ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so my name is Damir and I'll give a presentation about flash effect. And I know that we already talked about this, but I think it's a good topic to mention once more. But before we start that, I would like to use this opportunity to introduce myself. So my name is Damir Skriel. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina from the capital city of Sarajevo. And I'm a master's student at University of Sarajevo, but currently I'm living in Heidelberg, Germany, and I'm working on my master thesis research at DKFZ uh, about flash effect. 
Uh, my supervisors, I have two. Uh, it's uh, Professor Dr. Joao Seco, and I work with his biomedical physics in radiation oncology group. And also I have a mentor in uh, Sarajevo, it's Professor Dr. Adnan Beganovic. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, radiation therapy a lot, but as you can, could see, there, is, there are still some problems. And the goal is in radiation therapy research actually to keep discovering, keep researching uh, novel techniques so we can minimize some effects like motion, organ motion or uh, range uncertainties. Also, uh, we have a problem with radio resistant tumors and that is where flash effect comes. Uh, so, uh, what is flash effect? It's a phenomenon where the ultra high dose radiation, which is about four, 40 grays per second, uh, reduces the normal tissue toxicity commonly associated with conventional radiotherapy while still maintaining the local tumor control. And this didn't come out of nowhere. There were several studies, but uh, the one that actually sparked the interest in flash effect once more, uh, it was published in 2014. And on the left side, you can see the, uh, this figure, uh, which represents time dependence of pulmonary fibrosis in mice after uh, irradiation uh, and compares conventional uh, dose rates, uh, which are uh, red, and also we have a flash rate, uh, those rates which are blue. And so also maybe I should explain what actually is pulmonary fibrosis. It's a condition which uh, develops uh, after irradiating uh, lungs. It's a side effect and we don't want it in radiotherapy. So as you can see, the, during uh, weeks uh, after radiation, uh, the development uh, on conventional rates was much higher than on uh, flash dose rates. And there are many studies that actually are proving that flash effect is, exists. Uh, but still, uh, when I first uh, was introduced to this, uh, I really couldn't understand, it, to be honest, because during my studies, I always thought uh, that the only, the, the most important actually physical unit that creates damage is those. Uh, but uh, now we have to think about this new physical unit, which is dose rate. So dose rate is very important, as you can see. Uh, uh, and that is actually uh, what is my research about. So, uh, but before I come to that, uh, what is going on during flash radiation? Well, we still don't know uh, the exact, exact biochemical mechanism that results in flash effect, uh, but there is a popular hypothesis that actually suggests that oxygen depletion uh, at ultra high dose rates somehow modifies the radiochemical events uh, that happen during the radiation. Because in this short exposure of uh, time frame, uh, local oxygen is actually depleted much faster than reoxygenation reoxyge can occur. So we kind of create this transient state of uh, hypoxia. And now what is hypoxia? Well, hypoxia basically means oxygen depleted. And we somehow create also radio resistance in such uh, tissues and we protect them. But still, uh, okay, that's, if we accept that, how can we explain what happens uh, during the tumor radiation and we still have a good tumor control? Well, uh, what is generally accepted is that uh, tumors are more hypoxic than normal healthy tissue. So there is a small change in oxygen and the resistance is actually unchanged. So we can, in the, in the same time, damage tumor uh, effectively, efficiently, and also spare the normal tissue. But as I have mentioned, this isn't really, there is no exact uh, explanation. This is just a hypothesis. But what we could can observe actually 
that there is a dependence to dose rate. And that is what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to inco incorporate dose rates uh, in Matrad. So uh, we can simulate flesh and therefore we could uh, better understand it. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, what I have learned is that a good radiotherapy treatment plan takes time and experience. It really takes. It's not so easy. <laughs> and researching it takes a bit of coding. And I started with using just Matra GUI. So for those uh, who are just using Matra GUI, don't worry, because I think the most important part during this school is actually to uh, introduce yourself to how do you how can you actually create a radiotherapy treatment plan? Uh, and in, with some experience, you get used to it and you can also start your research like I'm doing. And it's uh, very exciting and I'm learning a lot. I'm at the beginning as Yota mentioned. Uh, and that will be it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Damir. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I suggest uh, to go to the next presentation and then take questions for both of them. Uh, we go to the next uh, student, also from uh, Sarajevo, that is uh, selected as a CERN summer student and to work actually uh, with uh, Niklas, uh, who suggested this uh, topic. And it's about a month uh, that uh, he started working on this topic. Uh, Stipe, you can uh, share your presentation on mute uh, and please go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay, I will. Okay. Okay, you all see it. Can you all see my presentation? Uh, yes. Very well. Yes. Go okay. to full screen. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, great. Go uh, ahead. So before everything, uh, hello, my name is Tipe. Uh, and thank you for the introduction and for this great opportunity to speak uh, in front of so many people. It's something that I have never done before and uh, hopefully it will go well. I'm a bit uh, nervous, but uh, I think it will uh, it will all go well. Uh, in this short uh, presentation, I will speak about uh, plateau surface approximation and multi-criteria optimization for intensity modulated radiotherapy. Uh, just a second, okay. Uh, but but first, something about myself. My name is Deep, as I as I have mentioned. I come from uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. And I go to the same university as Damir. We are both the same, uh, uh, this, uh, went to the same classes and all. And uh, right now I'm doing the last semester as a physics student and uh, doing the thesis that I'm uh, uh, Pareto surface approximation and uh, criteria optimization under the supervision of uh, Professor Dr. Adam Beganovic and Dr. Niklas Wall. So uh, before everything, uh, we all know what is uh, radiation therapy all about. Uh, it's about controlling and uh, killing uh, cancer cells by using ionization radiation. And the whole point is to deliver a prescribed dose to the tumor that is located inside the patient's body and to spare the normal tissue as much as, it, as it's possible. So the main underlying problem of this radiation therapy is the normal tissue doses. Because we want to keep the normal tissue dose zero and the dose to the tumor to be as, as it is prescribed. But since it, since it is impossible to keep the normal tissue dose zero, then the next step is to keep it as low as it's reasonably possible. So we have those two conflicting goals or criteria. And the whole point of creating optimal therapy plans is to actually try to find a, a, a common ground between those uh, criteria or goals and uh, in their simplest form there can be two goals uh, that is high tumor dose that uh, uh, high enough tumor dose versus low normal tissue dose and uh, we cannot have them both at the same time so we try to find the uh, middle ground between them and uh, one of the ways to do optimization is to use Pareto optimization and Pareto optim optimization is creating a state that is called Pareto optimality. And the definition of Pareto optimality is that it's a state at which goals or criterions in a given system are optimized in such a way 
that one goal cannot be improved without worsen, worsening the second one. Or in a case that uh, we have multiple criteria, then changing one criteria will uh, result in, um, in worsening at least one other criteria. And the uh, whole point of Pareto optimization is to create a set of Pareto optimal plans. And um, every Pareto optimal plan is in a sense optimal, but not from a medical perspective. So it is uh, up to a physician to decide which of those given plans is the best, best scenario for, uh, for treating the patient. And uh, then the whole goal, uh, I mean, the main goal, the main focus of my work is to implement Pareto optimization into MATRED. And uh, it basically means modifying the already existing quotes, doing something, uh, changing the quotes. So it gives a set of Pareto optimal plans. And uh, as, as far as I'm concerned right now, it's been mostly about waiting since uh, I try to do something, then I wait 10 minutes, then I see that I forgot to put the, the brackets on, then I do it again. But uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I like it. So yeah, that's it. So thank you for your time. <laughs> it wasn't as good as I wanted to be, but- uh, Great, uh, thank be, you very uh, much. Be kind. Yeah. That was very be nice. Kind. Part of hey, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Uh, school uh, is uh, for students uh, to yeah. learn, to prepare, and to learn to give presentations. Great. And sorry for all the stress that I put. Yeah, in. yeah. You, <laughs> uh, it's a good thing to prepare me for the same summer school. Right. At least yeah. you only have to wait for ten minutes for a result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. During my PhD, I did computations that took like three days, and then you realize that you put a parameter wrong, and then everything. <laughs> blows up and then you do everything over again okay i don't want to speak about my times that we were going with a bunch of cards like that okay uh, i'm an ancient person uh, nicholas on you the honor to start with questions or uh, any comments on the okay, last should I stop presentations? Uh, sharing my screen then yes I, like i think like we have yeah. seen now two student projects that are basically in their in their first month in a sense and uh it's, I think, very nice to see that you already learned within the first month to understand the problem and, and present about it. So that's that's really cool. Um, um, so thank you for also being uh, um, brave enough to present it already. Um, so I guess uh, both projects um, um, are, are super interesting. The Flash project basically goes on on, on a very hot topic in, in proton therapy and also in, in, in other modalities. The, um, the Pareto surface approximation has been already tried out for, for, um, um, for photons quite a lot. It's quite common there. And it will be quite interesting to compare these Pareto surfaces for different modalities. I think that is also something where we want to go through to see basically how do they compare um, in carbon plants and proton plants and photon plants, so so that's um, that's that that will be quite interesting. So I'm very happy to see the results of both of these works. We also have like more people <laughs> um, 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 working on 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 flash, more yeah. students, and so on. And that might be um, like all of these projects might be quite interesting uh, thesis um, that that we can uh, that that we will have in a few months. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, I don't know if uh, Sylvia wants to make any comments. Uh, no. Then uh, maybe. So now I'm, I'm in the triple planning room. Uh, no, that was really interesting. Um, you did great. Sorry? I lost you. We no, it's not you. okay. Uh, then uh, can hear you. <laughs> no problem. Not uh, let's go to the next uh, presentation. Um, that uh, we have a student that volunteered actually, uh, Stella Velosa, to give uh, um, some uh, comments on the results that she prepared, and uh, she uploaded a presentation of uh, eleven pages. Actually, Stella. Uh, are you there? Are you ready? Can you share your presentation? 
Um, yes, I am here. I, I will share my screen. Yeah. Just a second. But I'm afraid we are not going to have time to go through all presentations. So let's uh, see uh, all uh, slides. Uh, sorry, because then we have presentations from Egypt as well. Uh, go uh -huh. ahead. You can start, and uh, then uh, Niklas or Hans Peter they can comment. Go ahead, okay. please. Thank. Oh, okay. Then uh, I want to to share with you my experience uh, with uh, the, the first session. It, it was easy to familiarize, familiarize with uh, my rat using the has the hands-on instructions and the explanations. I am a beginner. And then I, I am I am a really good example that the the results of the first session. Uh, the the first task was to compare uh, two plants with photos. Was was one with one beam and the other with five beams. And I learned from the from the from the from the task that to compare the the plants we can use for organs at risk the mean dose and the maximum dose because uh, I I mean I think that uh, in, in looking for a reduction on the maximum dose we have uh, also reduction or less uh, uh, hot spots in, in in the organs at risk and <clears throat> comparing the targets uh, you suggest to use the mean uh, dose and the and the minimum dose and the mean dose. And uh, it was easy to select which plant was good using these uh, two topics to, 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 var to value it because uh, I think uh, we uh, select the plant that has less gradient we, when we select the, the plant that has minimum dose. Um, in, the, in the second task, we are uh, using a proton therapy and comparing with photons. And I use the same tools that you uh, teach us in the first stack um, and comparing the two plants. And it, it was amazing to see that only with one beam, uh, we, we reach very good results. We have reduction in the mean dose and the, the, the maximum dose in the organic bricks. And uh, we get uh, the same dose in in the in the target in the tumor, and um, after that we compare uh, two protons uh, plants uh, using one beam and three beams, and it was not so clear for me what uh, was um, if I I get the good resource, but I get the same dose in tumors, and uh, but the dose in the organs at risk increased. I think it is because the distribution of the angles of the of the of the beams uh, that is not the best. Um, well, maybe maybe the, the intention was to see the difference using one and three, but it was not so clear for me. And the third task was the challenging because uh, it's very difficult to get a good plan using the the, the prescriptions that um, we have around nine. Uh, prescriptions and if, if, if you reach one you can maybe not reach the others and uh, I did the plan that uh, we have in the session with five beams and then I modify and use seven beams and in the using uh, the the seven beams I uh, get in I have here in, in yellow the values the of the prescription that I can not fulfill and using Seven beams, I get best results in the in the in the target, but um, I have more ideas that how uh, how can improve the plan. But I have to use more Marat to to do this part uh, because uh, I think the 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 key is to modify the values here. And um, I well, I want to try to create artificial structures for the rectum and for the bladder. And to increase the dose in the PPD, no use the reference dose. I mean, if it's 68 grades, I will use 70. And I think my problem, my big problem was the femoral heads. And I think using a mean dose constraint, it could be better. But I, I have to, to learn how to do this. 
And for the second part of the protons, uh, well, I use an anterior and posterior beams, and the, all the prescriptions were fulfilled. And then, thank you so much. Very, very, very nice uh, session. Uh, you were super fast and very super efficient. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Can, maybe you can say a couple of words about yourself. I see that you are from University of Columbia and uh -huh. you are doing your PhD. Maybe you can give a couple of uh, comments on what you are doing. What is your research? Um, well, yeah, my, my name is Estela Velosa. I, um, I did my PhD at the DKFZ. And, and I did my postdoc uh, at the LMU uh, with Katia, uh, where uh, Hans is uh, doing uh, his, his work. And I am now um, a professor at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And I am learning uh, Marat to, to uh, use in educational uh, in my courses, but also for research. It's uh, very interesting for me uh, to, to learn this tool. Great. Uh, yes. So on Nicholas and Hans Peter then. Thanks a lot. We, we, are, we are always very happy when there are new uh, MATLAB users and um, um, yes, I think that was for giving it, it was the first tutorial session um, yesterday. That was, that was quite some good work. Um, I can answer some of your questions directly. So that, that came up um, with this three beam setup. Um, the, the thing about the three beam setup was to show it, it doesn't improve on these statistics um, quite a lot, but what it does, it like reduces this entrance channel dose um, that you get when you use one spread out break peak from, one, from, from one proton beam, you have like a higher entrance dose and you can mitigate this with multiple um, beams. But of course, as we also heard earlier, using multiple beams and then optimizing them maybe as, as single fields might also help you um, um, with robustness a little bit. And that is like about the second task with the prostate case. I think that was like the point of the of the prescriptions because um, I kind of engineered them that way that it's very difficult for the photon plan to 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 fulfill them, um, and uh, that's also what you probably experience. There is some tuning possible, but it's really difficult to get close to the goals. And um, with the protons, it's quite easy. But from the tutorial today, you might maybe rethink the, the setup because you're stopping in front of the rectum. And if you are very um, have very good imaging and maybe like very good range verification, that might work. Um, but it would probably maybe be a little bit, uh, you would choose maybe a little bit different beam directions. Uh, actually, but I don't want to say anything because I'm also not, a, not very much a clinical routine. Um, but there's like issues with stopping in front of the rectum and the bladder, for example. Um, because... No, but the, uh, sorry, the, the main problem, so I, I don't really want to um, let the message that one single beam, it's a good idea. Yeah. I, I just had to admit that sometimes we did it because we didn't really had a choice, but, so, but that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that the, the problem with the rectum and bladder and so on is that they tend to change. So they change the shape, they change position, they change uh, filling. And uh, you can uh, try with different kinds of preparations. Usually patients um, treated for prostate cancer, they have very complex preparation with plismans um, and uh, they, can, they had, have to drink one glass of water just half an hour before or maybe five minutes after, and then they have to go to the toilet and uh, it's very, and usually it's not very easy to reproduce the um, internal organ situation. And every small change in the spinning or in the shape or in the position is gonna affect the position of your prostate. And then, so uh, maybe you have been very, very good in uh, painting your plan, but then it's not uh, going to work. So this is also something that it's very, um, uh, challenging usually. Uh, you, you also need to have a very uh, a good, you should have a good convincity in room when you do prostate with, uh, with protons, which we kind of have, but uh, not so good. So we, we don't really do many prostates and um, be, because that's a very important aspect. Otherwise photons are much better. If you, if you do protons, but you don't do them in the right way, then for some cases it's better to do protons. 
Thank you. And yes, it can take a lot of time. Uh, what I was saying before, uh, because I moved to the TPS room, but the connection was not working, so I'm sorry. What I was saying to the student before is that yes, it can take uh, a lot of time to do a treatment plan, a real treatment plan. But Sylvia, maybe I'll ask you a question. How many beams do you use for protons, for, for, for prostate? Do you use one or two beams? So for prostate, we, we only do it with carbons. And I think patients are selected uh, as uh, advanced, uh, uh, re high risk. Uh, I don't really know the clinical uh, definition because I, I almost never do the prostate, but uh, uh, we use two uh, contralateral beams. And uh, we mostly do a uh, boost. So it's a boost protocol uh, after, well, actually it's, um, we first do a four fraction of carbon ions uh, as a boost, and then they do um, IMRT in uh, with photons in the European Institute of Oncology. And for the full treatment, again, it's two contralateral beam. But the boost is not the whole carbon ions. But the boost is not the whole prostate, right? It's just a small section of the prostate. That's a good question. So you avoid the rectum mm. when you come in from the contralateral beams, right? For the, mm, no, I think it's a full prostate for the, for the boost. But I never do these plans, so uh, because for the for the full treatment, we have a first part, uh, which is the full prostate, and then a second part, which is our boost. So it's nine fraction the full prostate, and then seven fractions uh, just a part of the prostate that, where the rectum has been um, spared, so somehow uh, saved. So for this, I'm sure we have these two. Um, uh, it's a sequential boost uh, treatment when it's full carbon ions. And the first part is the full prostate. The second part, uh, it's uh, according to the Japanese um, protocol. In the second part, the rectum, it's, uh, I don't know how to call it. it it's fair, anyhow. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, the connection broke up. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the full prostate, mm -hmm. they say. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thanks to everybody. But they also do uh, re-evaluation CTs every week and the combined CT every day. And they do a, a specific uh, preparation, treatment preparation for the rectum and for the... Um, and several times if the combined CT is not okay, uh, then the preparation starts again uh, or the patient goes to in the CT room. And so it's very... Uh, adaptive, adapted. This is a great uh, discussion because we wanted also to give uh, the feeling to the students of experts of uh, different uh, institutes uh, working together on the data and uh, optimizing uh, treatment planning, etc. That is going to come one day, I believe. So now uh, let us give the chance to the students from um, Egypt. Mahmoud, you are there. Hello, Mahmoud. Yes, I am here. Yes. Are you going to share uh, the presentation? No, uh, I will let my students do it, okay? Yes. And as you know, uh, I have here a lot of students from different faculties. They are in the first stage. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, they are in the first stage uh, at their university. And uh, uh, all these students uh, choose uh, six students to uh, express them because uh, due to uh, limitation of time, okay? So uh, only six students uh, will uh, present today, okay? Um, Thank you. Uh, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see the screen. If you go full screen. Okay, one, one second, please. Okay, so Basim will start now, okay? Okay, hello. Uh, we first uh, actually used, uh, we opened the MATRAD and we used, uh, we took the sample CG119. Uh, we used a, the photon uh, for uh, 
one angle beam. Uh, as you can see, the, the concentration of the damage was actually outside the tumor on the safe tissues, and the uh, less concentration was inside. Uh, the tumor didn't really completely irrigate it. And uh, if I could zoom in here. Uh, uh, we could, if we could really see the data, but I can't really zoom in. Uh, the data says that um, the, the outer core had the most uh, effective from through the mean. Um, Uh, so the mean value for the outer target was uh, 1.5905, which was the most uh, effective part. Uh, but the damage was uh, on the healthy tissues right here. Uh, for the next uh, slide, uh, another of my colleagues will explain it for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, as my uh, friend Basim uh, showed uh, as a first slide, we uh, we use uh, uh, one angle beams uh, of protons. Uh, here we will uh, use uh, five angle beams uh, of photons. Uh, we uh, as we edit figure on the screen, uh, we uh, we see the outer target uh, have have the mean value of uh, the photons. Uh, and the next slide will my colleague uh, show it. Hello, my name is Tasneem Fluki. I will tell you about third dust test. Um, in the previous test, uh, test number two, we used uh, photons. Now we will uh, talk about protons. Uh, so we, if you would, uh, if you look about the parameter, we use one angle only from proton, which is the radiation beam is proton, okay. Uh, and if uh, if we look at the outer target, which is the main circuit, we want to uh, get the higher radiation and high energy to um, to achieve our our target. We look at the, this number, which is the 1.6651, and then the core. Um, get uh, a very little uh, energy or radiation, which is uh, 0 0.2232. Uh, then the, the outer um, value is PVC, which is the body, uh, take only 0 0.0653. So if we um, do a comparison between um, second target, uh, second uh, task and third task, task we, um, we will not let that. Proton with one angle only is more perfect than uh, photon with five angles. So by this way, we get a high technique to, uh, uh, to get the main target with lower efficiency on the um, good uh, organs or healthy cells. Um, so um, I finish my task and we will talk about uh, my next student, which is uh, Sergei. Hello, my name is Tabrid Muhammad. My name is Tabrid Muhammad. Uh, I will uh, I will explain uh, the next uh, case. Uh, it was uh, a T TG one one nine one one nine three angle beam. Uh, pro, uh, in uh, proton, in proton, uh, is in this case I use uh, a three angle beam in proton, and the result in outer target, uh, where the in outer target where. Uh, outer target was uh, more uh, with more absorption uh, of radiation, uh, unlike uh, core and uh, and and organ of bodies. 
uh, saw the treatment with the proton uh, uh, in three angle beam is very good uh, to kill uh, the cell, the cancer cell, uh, and uh, protect uh, the normal of organs uh, uh, and the didn't damage it. Thank you. The case, uh, uh, my friend is uh, with uh, my friend is uh, uh, that's me. Hello, uh, my name is Ufni. I'm from the Muhammad, the Faculty of Science at Bell University of Old Thomas. Um, I will introduce uh, the, uh, the case file. Um, first, if we open the program, uh, MATLAB, uh, then we uh, load the MAT data, which is the organ uh, with data. Uh, the radiation move is photons. Uh, we use five angle beams, um, and then we uh, uh, calculate influence. Uh, then we uh, optimize, and we show the graph. Uh, then we show uh, uh, all results, and uh, it will uh, show in this uh, in this program. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, we are already running. Uh, we have one more. Yuta, yes. do you hear me? Yes. No, uh, there is uh, the last person, please. Ah, yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Rani Esser, a student of third level biotechnology. Uh, I hope you all good. We want to target this midpoint. This midpoint represents the cancer. The, the mid of the cancer. As the previous slide, we show that uh, these five angles hurt the, the tissue badly. So we try two different angles, uh, angle 90 and angle 270, I, I can see clearly. Okay, so uh, these angles uh, hurt badly the, the cancer cell and hurt slightly the, the other tissues. So we, we found it uh, uh, more the best uh, from the other. And thank you. This is all for today. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and sorry for interrupting you. I thought uh, uh, that we are already running. Uh, in the um, social event time, I would like to give uh, the time to the social events as well. But I think, Nicholas, maybe you can uh, briefly comment. And then, uh, uh, Mahmoud, you have more presentations that maybe we take uh, tomorrow, right? Uh, yes, we have another five minutes. Okay. Great. So this yeah. time. Nicholas, go please ahead and uh, con comment. Yes. Yeah. So I, I like it really much um, to see that. Um, yeah. um, the results um, basically are consistent across uh, the different uh, results that we saw so far. So um, for the um, previous uh, presentation where we also saw basically similar um, things. Um, so it's really nice that everybody manages to, to, to get to the same conclusions. So that's, that's really good. Yeah. And yeah, I really like to pick yeah, also really like uh, one comment from my side that uh, while going through the, these plans that step by step you add more complexity um, from, from photons, from one beam to single beams and then the protons and basically how um, you also progress and learn something out of that. So this is uh, really good to see. Yeah, that was really very nice to see. <laughs> thanks very much to both of you for your efforts to do the tutorials and uh, thanks to the participants, they are trying their best uh, and working on this and uploading results. It's really very nice, really grateful to everybody. Uh, and I think uh, we can uh, close uh, here for this session and I will pass uh, to Rebecca.